I heard you talking the other day about samsara and it not being the round of rebirth or that wheel of time mm. image. So what, what do you say that is? You, you mentioned it was, the translation was something like wandering on. Yeah, wonder- roaming, roaming on. Sa- uh, samsarati, if I remember correctly, it just means uh, roaming. Just keep roaming on and on and on and on. Now here, some, uh, then, then elsewhere. No, the, the whole idea of like a round of rebirth, uh, it's, a, it's a notion that people develop based on this life and based on, on the um, like self-centeredness of this life. By that I mean they use this life as a, as, a, as, a, as a reference point. And then from there you kind of die and sort of come back in you know, some sort of cycle. Um, but actually, uh, fundamentally, if you look at the experience from the point of view of the five aggregates there are no rounds it's just the rising and passing away of the very same thing so any rebirth that you might have it's within the five aggregates so then so that's why it's not even accurate to say oh, it's the five aggregates that get reborn because that would that would kind of imply five five aggregates traveling from one birth to, there is no travel from one birth to the other Rebirth is within the five aggregates, as in reappearance, re-emergence, it's within the five aggregates that you have and can know right here and now. That's why if somebody fully understands the nature of uh, Panchakanda, uh, they, they fully understood the nature of rebirth, the nature of reappearance. That's why the Buddha said, it's, uh, if, somebody, if somebody remembers the previous, previous life, one previous life, or five previous life, of, of, of 500, eons ago, the lifetimes, all they're going to remember is the five aggregates or one among them. So that, that samsara is the five aggregates. Your experience as a whole is the container of the samsara. Within that, your point of view, your immediacy, the content of your senses, that can be different depending on the rebirth. It can be more refined, it can be, uh, it can be coarser, it can be pleasant, it can be torturous. but. Overall, in its nature, the five aggregates there. That's it. So, in a way, there is no like coming and going and, and, and cycling around the, the realm of no. The whole world, all of the realms, all the possible realms of your rebirth are within the five aggregates that you have right here and now. So, the the, the notion of rebirth, it's it's more accurately sort of um, reflected upon from the point of view of. Uh, like a change of rebirth would be change of immediacy change of the degree of of, of immediacy of your senses the nature of your senses but in terms of the nature of things the nature of phenomena the nature of things to appear there's no difference there so that's why that's why whenever they would, they would, they would, they would talk about the rebirth in the suttas it would be almost, like in a sense almost like a, like a memory like you remember what you've done yesterday you remember what you've done 10 days ago you remember what you've done 10 years ago and then yes yeah, some people might remember what they've done 10 lifetimes ago but it's still the same that same container of their experience the same nature of the fire it's almost the same point of view in a way so, so the notion of you traveling from one rebirth to the other it's a notion based on the projection of the external world external point of view uh, independent of your experience as a whole and that's 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 complete fallacy you can't even conceive things in such a purely impersonal manner because they would require you to generally step outside of yourself outside of the container of your five aggregates outside of your point of view and thinking something outside of your point of view it's inconceivable because whatever you can conceive it's within your point of view it's from your point of view so the point of view arises and ceases well the point or changes i suppose yeah well the degree of point of view can change within the within the container of the five aggregates. Like, for example, with the animals, um, being being the lower realm means their point of view, their capacities of reflection, are more uh, forcefully absorbed with the content of the senses. So that's why they can't step back and become aware of their situation, or they can do it to a very little degree. Mostly, it's just absorption with immediacy. Hunger, hunger, fear, fear, play, play, running, chasing, fighting. 
they can't just wait a minute why am I doing this they don't have that much space in that reflection in their point of view it's too absorbed but it's still the point of view that's why somebody can remember the previous lifetimes because it's through these uh, through this container of the five aggregates that generates this point of view you can actually remember more so a, a, a life doesn't last long but a point of view can last very long well yeah. you know in a way that's true but the problem is again even when people think about the notion of time they think in this external uh, scientific impersonal sense and that's inconceivable as in things are in time so then you can say the life lasts this much and by the point of view lasts forever that's why the, the that's why the notion any notion of, of, of eternity in a sense of permanence it's it's wrong because it's founded in a wrong view and the wrong view is that which contradicts the nature of the phenomena the way they appear you can't step outside of the five aggregates you assuming the world outside of your five aggregates means you're basically uh, having a wrong assumption in regard to the nature of the, the, of the way that the five aggregates are so you could truly say that if you want to be accurate you, you can't say that our five aggregates last for long because that would imply that they're in time while in reality your notion of time is already within that container of the five aggregates your experience as a whole so then more accurately you would say that five aggregates are not in time five aggregates are off time as in your notion of duration is already on the basis of enduring five aggregates but yes uh, not so strictly speaking you can say yeah it lasts well it lasts infinitely but not eternally so, there's many different points of view like, like I have a point of view now here in your point of view well, again, they would, they the would assume the external view. point of view. They could then compare all these different points of view. No, you have your point of view. There is this point of view. That's it. That's all you can know. Now you can come close to my point of view, but you can't have my point of view because that would require you becoming me as an individual. And there that's is, inconceivable. There is your point of view. Yeah, well, there is internal point of view, the one that you know for yourself, and then you can see other point other point, points of view such as external points of view so you can say there are points of view but you can't see them on the same level or you can't even compare them on the same level because they would require you to step outside of your point of view that you're in, in, inseparable from and then what about development or well not exactly development but evolution theory of evolution so I will continually evolve, evolve my point of view will, will get better naturally oh no, no of course not no. To super no. being to what, what evolves is not a point of view it's the well what can be said to evolve or proliferate depending how you want to call it is the senses and and uh, the world around the immediacy uh, around the content of your experience but the, the point of view is more on level of how you regard that content how you see it how much you allow it to control you to absorb you to to deprive you of your own capacity of your own um, act of reflection Shut it. so in that sense point of view can is, is it's it's pretty much well it's it's indirectly affected by proliferation and evolution as in it always it always maintains potential of stepping back and reflecting upon the immediacy uh, of your current birth so there's, a, there's these realms with the animal realm the human realm and the in between that I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, the, the realms in between that, I think maybe ghosts or something. Uh-huh. But there, there is no stepping, there's no halfway realm. Oh, right. Well, there's no crossing yeah. between the realms. What do you sure. call it, the uh, missing link? No, because again, any any notion of, of, of comparison, connection, would require an external point of view, point of view that's independent of, of yourself, of your five aggregates, of your experience as a whole. And that's inconceivable. 
So all you know, phenomenologically speaking, is what you have. As in, a, based on that, you can then infer that the immediacy and the senses and the sense engagement can be different, as in, it can, it can exercise a different extent, a different amount of force over you. Like for animals, the senses exercise way too much force for the reflection to be able to maintain itself um, as much as a human can do. But there is no crossing, like there is the animal realm that sits here, then there is the human realm that sits here, and then a being goes into animal realm, and then it kind of floats from animal into human or something like that. That's like a, a, an externally projected notion of some sort of cosmology. I mean, if you're talking about it, there is no other way to talk about it than in these external terms, but those designations should not be misunderstood. When it comes to your point of view, you can only see it from the inside. And that's how, that's how, that's how the Buddha would refer that, like an arahant or somebody who is fully understood, understood the samsara. Not by traveling in previous lives or waiting for the future lives. No, he understood the content. He understood the, sorry, not the content, the container, the basis on account of any uh, different content can manifest itself. And by saying different content means different birth. Content of an, anim content of an animal realm or content of a deva realm. As in the refinement of the con content, the type of engagement of the content, uh, that's basically what, what you can refer to as a, a birth, a realm. So you don't necessarily uh, develop each birth. You're not getting better. Oh no, no, sure, yeah. no, no. Primary, primary. You're getting either worse, better, worse, better. Well, based on your actions, they will kind of play the part into what kind of content you're going to be. Your point of view will be paired with later on. In the same sense, again. You, can, you don't have to think about previous life and future life. It's the principle that you can extend. But you can think within this life. If the, if the actions you're making now are quite unwholesome, harming a lot of people, for example, causing lots of damage, you can safely assume that your whole life is heading that direction. So then in five, six years, when the whole world is against you, they're trying to imprison you, they chase you because of the crimes you committed, your content has been significantly changed. To, to like like more pressing, more enduring, more unpleasant, because of your actions, they've been affecting in that manner. If if uh, if your actions are in this very life are actually not harming anybody, are are helpful to everyone, then yeah, the, that that's going to be influencing your environment the most. Not 100% because there are many other many other factors that can many other factors that can play the part, but to a great deal. If a person doesn't go around committing crimes, they don't have to worry about whether anybody's going to get them, catch them, uh, exercise revenge on them. But those who do, that becomes your daily uh, environment. That becomes your daily content of the phenomena that keeps appearing for your point of view, of the further actions you do on account of it. So you could then see if you carry on that kind of behavior for years, it's not a, it's not a big stretch to assume that, oh yeah, so when this life sort of breaks apart with this body breaks apart, the content that's going to re-arise is just going to carry on further in the same direction, because that's how you've been exercising your point of view and your actions and your intentions. There's no like a natural end to samsara, where you just get better, better, no. but ev yeah. evolve in a good way, evolve, evolve. Well, in a way, it's again, it's not like that you re-enter samsara through your re You are the samsara. The five aggregates affected by ignorance is what samsara is. <coughs> This, this experience of the five aggregates for somebody who is not enlightened, that's, that's already what samsara is, which means this experience is just going to stay infinitely. Unless a person frees this very experience from that ignorance, uh, then it will not reappear. The content will not, well, you won't be paired with any content, with any form that point of view will not be paired, it will just go extinct, as the Buddha would describe Nibbana as extinction. It won't go anywhere else. It, well, it doesn't go anywhere else. That would require you to jump from a point A in space to a point B in space, which then assumes the external point of view of space. 
which is only can be based on the five aggregates right here, right now. So that's why your experience is not in space and in time, it's off space and off time. You get the notion of space based on your perceptions and notion of time pretty much based on your feelings and their endurance. So it's secondary to it. So if you stop thinking in terms of I'm in space and time, then the whole notion of rebirth becomes much more intelligible and it just fits perfectly with pretty much everything else that you can know right here and right now. Point of view is beyond time. It's off time. Off it's time. not beyond time because again that assumes time and now it's something, something beyond. Else. Notion of time is basically a result of the point of view. And space. Notion of time and space is a result of point of view. It's a result of the five aggregates. So in a way, like again, you can think of it on the level of this life. So say you have you today is you know a new day, you do you do certain you do certain things and so on, then you go to sleep. Then you wake up. Then again, it's a new day, you do things, but okay, you have a memory of yesterday and so on, that will affect your choices today. You have assumption of tomorrow, it's gonna to affect your choices today and so on. Uh, but it's all within your experience as a whole, within your point of view, within the five aggregates. You wouldn't be asking yourself, oh, uh, was it me from yesterday, the same who became the one today and is gonna be the one tomorrow? No, it's just me who went to sleep yesterday and now I woke up and in a way it's a new day from a reference point of view of, 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 of yesterday, as in from a memory. But all of that is within this experience today. So you can extend yesterday, 10 years ago, 10 lifetimes ago. You've just been waking up in different environments, so to speak. So that's why oh, what does, what, the question of who gets reborn is a wrong question because it assumes this external floating from one life to another and what is it that it changes and goes there. That's why the Buddha wouldn't even answer it because it's based on a completely wrong premise of this external world point of view that it's kind of independent of you. But you can't possibly conceive anything like that because if something, if you're conceiving something independent of you, you can only do so on account of depending upon your experience of the five objects, which means it's not truly independent. Hence, it's a completely wrong view. Hence, any question that will come out of it, as in who gets reborn from uh, life number one to a life number two, it just requires this, this uh, non-existent external world independent of your experience, independent of your sense of being and your point of view. So that's why, yeah, just ask yourself, yourself that you can remember from 10 years ago, who's that? How did that person from 10 years ago become you today? And you realize that's, well, that's not really a right question to formulate like that. How did it? Because you would assume that something has kind of traveled independent of you from a point of view in the past to a point of view right here. But no, it's just, no, it's just this point of view, this experience has been enduring for 10 years. There have been changes on a particular level, while overall it was remaining the same container. The same nature of perception. I, you've been having different perceptions, different intentions, you've been performing different actions 10 years ago, because you had different values and different views, but overall it was still the nature of perception, the nature of feeling, the nature of intention, the nature of the views. And that's within this. And you realize, oh, you can't step outside of that. Arahan doesn't step outside of it. He actually realizes that outside is inconceivable, so, so he stops conceiving it. And by doing so, he removes ignorance in regard to the inside of himself, in regard to the nature of perception, feeling, intention, the nature of the view. And that's how he extinguishes that container. It ceases to be the fertile ground for this maintenance of the being. He doesn't assume outside of his experience. No, no, no. That's, that's, well, even Sotapanna stops assuming that. Like the fundamental, the core of the, the external assumption of your own experience is Atavada, the external sense, sense of self, pretty much, independent of this experience. And that's why they would ask, who gets reborn? Because they assume 
the, the impersonal world, the impersonal space and time from which things just flow from one birth to the other realm to this realm. But no matter the realm, the nature of the five aggregates is the same. Which means, oh, so if you want to find how it is in more subtle realms or, 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 uh, or uh, coarser realms, you can do so on account of understanding the nature of this experience that you have, because it's within it. That's why, and that's why it's called roaming onwards. It's just this experience just keeps perpetuating itself on and on and on. And the Buddha, again, he did give a simile that illustrates that. He said, it's like a man leaving his home village and then goes to the next village. Then from that village he goes to the next village. Then from that village he goes to the next village. And then at 20th village, they ask him, where did you come from? And he says, well, before this village, I was in this village. Before that, I was in another village and another village and another village. So yeah, if you were to describe it to somebody else, it would sound like that external manner. But from his point of view, he was always in the village that he was in. He couldn't step outside of himself and then um, explain to himself how oh, he didn't need to. How he from one village crossed to another village. No, it was just, I was in this village, then I went on to another village. But it's still the same experience. Each time he was in different village, he had a different content of a village. But in terms of the nature of his experience, perception of the village, intentions of the village, feelings in the village were the same. The nature remained the same, the nature of the five aggregate. That's what the Buddha meant. He said, even if you remember 500 lifetimes more from before, all you're remembering is these five aggregates right here, right now, or one among them. It's within this. You also said you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot know the five aggregates directly, or you cannot assu you, you assume them. Well, you cannot examine them and take them apart again, because that would require the external point of view in regard to them. You can only see the insides of the five aggregates. And when you think, oh, this is the inside, you already start implying the assumption, the con conceiving of the outside. That's what the Buddha meant. He conceives in matter, from matter, apart from matter. He conceives matter is mine. He conceives, and then he goes on in that Mula Pariyaya Sutta for all the other aggregates and all the other ways. By implicitly perceiving it as, ah, this is the inside, you automatically assume the outside to an extent. So you ha just have to undo that implicit conceiving and then the assumption of the outside will fade. Undo the implicit conceiving. Yeah. And you, again, you undo that implicit conceiving not on account of um, finding out the external view of the five aggregates and then examining it one by one. That's inconceivable. That's impossible. You undo it by uh, stop regarding it as mine, right here, right now. By seeing that it's independent of you. By seeing that it's subjected to, to, to destruction. Inaccessible. That it's inaccessible. Because yeah. if you were truly able to access it and control it, it would obey you, it would listen to you, it would go with you. For example, being mindful of the body or form. Earth well, exactly. Like, like some people, some minds can go to the subtle level of being mindful of the earth element. But whether you're mindful of the earth element, whether you're mindful of the body seated on this chair, it's, it's the same principle. That's why you can arrive at the same goal without needing to refine it to the point of the earth element. Being mindful of your experience as a whole bound up with this body, with this form, without overdoing your thought into assuming the external world point of view, but without becoming negligent in regard to your own uh, absorption with your own senses. So again, if a person wants to reflect along these lines, they can within this, with, ex with experience and the memories of this life. Same. If I ask you, where were you, I don't know, five days ago? You said, I was there. Where were you ten years ago? I was there. So in a way, yeah, there was some change. But within, your point of view hasn't changed. Your views might have changed. But the direction of you having views, the experience as a whole, the nature of perception, the, nat the nature of body, the form, the nature of feeling, the nature of perception, the nature of intention, the nature of consciousness, that hasn't changed. That container has remained unchanged since you can remember. And that's the thing. 
So I rem you remember since when you were two years old, and that's kind of where it stopped. But it only stops because your memory stops there. But the principle carries on, which means then, yes, yeah, some people can then start remembering more. But it's still within the same principle of, of the memory that you know. So that's why in that sense it's not correct to say that it's, oh yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's my sense of self that got reborn or it, it was previously in this life, now it's in this life, then it will go in another life. No, it's not in space and time. So there's memory? Where does memory sit? Where does memory sit? Yes, well, it sits in that, that, that infinity of, of change on a more particular level within the container that stays the same. The container of your experience as a whole, the container of the five ugly, the container of your point of view. That's why memory is, in a way, endless. Sorry, beginningless. Because there was no first beginning before which you didn't exist and then you became. As the Buddha said, Avijja has no first point when it manifests. It shouldn't be there, but it is there, and, and, and its being there is beginningless. That's why once you undo it, cannot re-arise, cannot reappear, cannot re-emerge, because it was never meant to be there. The ignorance, the, the assumption of the external point of view, all of that was not meant to be there. It doesn't fit there. The Upadana is not the five aggregates, cannot be the five aggregates, cannot become the five aggregates, cannot enter the five aggregates, but cannot be found apart from them. So desire and lust, which is another way of saying misconceiving the five aggregates, the Upadana, the assumptions are there in regard to it. You stop misconceiving it, the Upadana fades. And so does the wonder now. Exactly. There is no more uh, being bound with the content like this, then like that, then another one, then another one. No. So the, what generates samsara is ignorance, craving. Uh, what generates, maybe not the right word. Uh, what keeps it going? Yeah, what maintains samsara? But if, so if you don't have that, if you don't have ignorance, going? samsara cannot be maintained. Just back to memory. I'm saying, where does it sit? It's a mental. Again, where does it sit implies placement mm -hmm. in space. Oh, it's over here. But that assumes the external point of view, where it can place it, like a box on a shelf or something. In space. No. At most, that can just be a figure of speech. But if that figure of speech is taken lit lit literally, as in, it, then you start assuming that it's in the space. In the brain. Yeah, it's in the brain. It's in the in, in a center or in, in some molecules there or something. Yeah. It's not more in your brain that it's in more, more in your toes. In the same sense, consciousness is not in your body. It's paired with the body. It's in regard to the body. But see, any notions that you have on account, any notions that you have of your body, it's on the basis of conscious body. Any notions that you have on account of, any notions that you have in regard to consciousness, it's on the basis of the conscious body. Conscious body is the basis that you cannot step outside of, nor separate and investigate separately that's why whenever you look at the body you're conscious whenever you're trying to discern consciousness the necessary living body needs to be there but the problem is when people look at either body or consciousness and then develop the view that places them underneath or rather as more fundamental than the diet of conscious body that you have right here right now but you can't step outside of it so then you have to realize that no, 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 doesn't matter how pleasing the, the notions of the body you might develop and the theories and the views, that can only be done within the container of conscious body. You cannot step outside of it. That's why scientific view is inherently wrong. Not wrong in terms of the content, but wrong in terms of the nature. That's why you cannot use science to arrive and explain the nature of being, the nature of experience, the nature of feelings for that matter. That's why whenever the scientists try to talk about feelings and describe feelings, they end up just describing um, perceptions of sensations in the body. But perception is perception and feeling is feeling. You can't feel your perceptions. So perceptions and feelings in the same sense like 
body and consciousness. They're paired, but they're independent of each other, but they're inseparable from each other. And the Buddha said that you can't, he said perception, feeling and intentions are, are, are conjoined. You cannot take them apart and examine them uh, separate from the other two. It means that's the basis that you cannot conceive different in any other shape or form. And any conceivings you have, it's within that container of that basis. Hence, if your conceivings are co contradicting the basis, it's a wrong view. That's why it's a wrong view. So that's why if you were to have a scientific view in terms of practicing the Dharma, it's a wrong view. Because it contradicts the nature of the basis on account of which you developed the scientific view. That external world that you cannot actually conceive, truly. You cannot access in that impersonal manner as the, as the science uh, leads you to believe. You can't. You always have a point of view. And the notion of, no, this is beyond the point of view, is within your point of view. Or this is external to my point of view. Well, you can only see that through your point of view, which means it's not external. The true external, well, see, you can't even designate it correctly. If you say the true external, well, it's not external then, because you're talking about it. You're designating something, and if there is something, even an ambiguous notion of external world, it's within this container of the five aggregates. Thus, it's not truly external. That's why there is no real matter a real reality behind these appearances or anything like that. What appears, that's what's real. So, like, like I should speak about God, like a God is like this, sure. God is inconceivable. Sure, sure. But, but you're you conceiving it through, through labeling it, through designating it, how oh, it's inconceivable. You cannot express the deity, the eternal, well you just expressed it, by saying it's, it's not expressible. No matter what you express, it is within. It's yep, yeah, yeah. So that's you realize you can't step outside of your of the experience as a whole, and that was never the point. That's why you stop looking for some hidden, transcendental realities, which is what usually think, what usually people think arahantship is. No, you realize you can't. You, you all you have to do is stop conceiving that there is outside to be found, because. Conceiving the outside is conceiving the independence of this experience as a whole. And that's the definition of Atavada, an independent sense of self, independent of the five aggregates, independent of the form, feeling, in, uh, perceptions, intentions and consciousness. Yet, any notion of that independence is based on this form, feeling, perception, intentions, consciousness. Thus, it's actually secondary to it, thus it cannot be independent. So that's all a person needs to do. Stop assuming the external. Stop assuming that master self. Stop conceiving it as possible. Yeah. And that's Mula Pariyaya Sutta in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. The very first Sutta in Majjhima The idea that uh, before anything there was nothing. Exactly. Well, that's something, because you're thinking of it. So you, if something is truly nothing, then you can't even designate it as nothing. As absence of something, it's just inconceivable. Thus, you can't even think it, and let alone designate it as something. So if you keep trying to think it, it means you just keep trying to contradict yourself, your own experience. So you shouldn't think it. Well, you should realize that it's unthinkable. And, and the projection towards thinking it, you realize, well, that's already thinkable within this. Thus, it cannot stand for that which is truly unthinkable. So when the thought of unthinkable stops conceiving something that it's thinkable. That's when the thought recognizes its own extent. Some philosophers speak about uh, being and nothingness. Yes, yes, but uh, the ones they do ended up assuming the external world from which they very plausibly defined being and nothingness. But that's already then contradicting the basic phenomenological principle that they used to arrive at it. So, uh, from that sutta, 
not in Nikaya 1. Uh -huh. He says a person can experience Nibbana, but he, is, he assumes Nibbana. Yeah, yeah. So he can have the experience of, of absence of greed, aversion, delusion. But uh, he can have it uh, affected by the ex assumption of external sense of self, external master, external point of view, ex the, the external scientific order. Thus, that experience of, uh, of not-self, that experience of freedom from greed, aversion, delusion, is appropriated by that fully gratuitous view. Thus, he conceives that Nibbana. He conceives in it, he conceives apart from it, <coughs> he conceives it as mine, and thus he cannot steady his mind. Well, because of that, that Nibbana cannot become the, um, the experience that he develops fully, consistently. But it is the Nibbana, because there is another Sutta in Majjhima later on where the Buddha gives a similar description <coughs> how a person with his conceit thinks, oh, I'm a, this is Nibbana, I'm attaining Nibbana, this, this Nibbana is mine. And the Buddha said, yeah, what he refers to is the actual Nibbana. But because of the self-centered point of view, because of those assumptions of self and mastery, he does not enter that Nibbana. He cannot sustain it. It's not a different Nibbana. It, it's, it's, it's a kopa. It's like when people try, oh no, it's a different Nibbana. It's just a, an easy way to dismiss it. But the Buddha himself said, although he asserts that which that is Nibbana, he doesn't enter it because he can't study his, uh, his experience in it. He keeps, he keeps misconceiving it. In terms of death being the end, hmm. being the ending of things, from what you were saying, it doesn't seem to be the end. No, you know, it's this and Death, uh, it's, it's, it's the end of the, um, the assumptions that you developed based on the familiarity with the current content of your experience. So that, it's the end of that. But it's, it's far from the end of the five aggregates. The true end. From being. It's far from the end of being, yeah. yeah. But yeah, most people, the entire life, the sense of self, the views, are based on the content of this present experience, on that assumption of the external world and that whole thing. So then, yeah, death ends all that. That's why it's so frightening. But if you had to... If you, the... Yeah, if you stop... If you, if you removed all the conceivings and stop wrongly assuming uh, things in regard to this content of this experience, this life, there is no death, hence the deathless. <laughs> that which is death can apply only where the content, where the assumptions in regard to the content of your senses exist. You remove the assumptions, that is the true deathless. It's just the notion of death is inconceivable. But that's almost what a lot of people would think that death is, you know, the complete you know, ending. Well, again, complete nothingness. But See, the fact that you can think that I mm. can have a notion of complete nothingness, well, that's something. Mm. That notion is real as such, which, me, which means it's not the true nothingness. Because if, it, if, if it's a true nothingness, you couldn't think it. But the non-conceiving that, the death is... Not conceiving that means stop assuming wrong things in regard to the nature of death. That's what not conceiving that means. Nibbana. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can have... An understanding of what Nibbana is, yeah. develop it, without assuming. Well, that's what, what development is. Yeah. Undoing the assumptions. You can't see any, can you see Nibbana? Well, no, you can, you can enter it. You can step into it, so to speak. You can't see it externally, examine it, because if you are seeing it like that, you're misconceiving it. So, you can enter Nibbana by removing all the assumptions that misconceive what Nibbana is. Then your experience automatically becomes the experience of Nibbana. But it's not like you do the work of removing the assumptions and then the gates open and then you walk into the Nibbana. No, undoing the work, removing all the conceiving is what Nibbana is. Is it misty again?
So in a way, you are striving to bring about the ending of being, yeah. of existence. Yeah. You're not striving to find, as I said, some kind of external transcendental entity that you merge with or, or that saves you. No. You're striving to stop misconceiving this very experience, to stop appropriating it as mine, stop entertaining a uh, mistaken gratuitous assumption in regard to it. And that will undo the being, because that's what being is. It's a mistake in regard to things that appear. Mistake of ownership, mistake of the, the, the sense of self, mistake of permanence. Because some people say that it sounds like a kind of trying to kill yourself, you know, like a suicide, an ultimate suicide. Uh, well, it's the suicide of ignorance, sure. It's the suicide of the self-view. But it's not the suicide of the content on, a, on account of which you develop the sense of self. That's like people killing the five aggregates, trying to kill the five aggregates because they can't get uh, rid of Upadana in regard to the Panchakanda. So that's not knowing what the problem is, you're attacking it at the wrong, at the wrong place. So that's usually what suicide is. Attacking the body, trying to kill the body, so it will kind of kill you. But if you are done your undone your sense of self, then you don't care about living or killing the body, because it's not suicide. Then. It's suicide when you're trying to get rid of that self sense of self by destroying the environment that supports it. But if you look at it as the way I described it, you can't destroy the five aggregates. You just keep changing the content of it through getting a different birth, different, different rebirth, which means you then can't, you don't, ex you don't, you, you don't do anything about the underlying problem of misconceiving the content that resulted in you having the self view in the first place. So you might have annihilated the, the temporary or rather the particular content, but overall your mistake in regard to the nature of the content stays the same. Hence, you keep getting born on and on and on again and keep reappropriating things, misappropriating, misconceiving and keep being bound by samsara. So the true suicide, the one that can truly kill that sense of self, is the one that doesn't kill the body, doesn't aim at the body, but actually undoes, undoes the ignorance in regard to the body, in regard to the phenomena of the body, and the, the experience as a whole. That removes the basis completely, uproots the sense of self, truly annihilates it. That's why Nibbana is annihilation of greed, aversion, delusion, of conceivings, of appropriation of the sense of self. But not annihilation of the content and of the environment and of the five aggregates. Because it, it's obviously suicide seems to be quite a bad Thing, yeah, yeah, because it's 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 just the further proliferation of already of the original mistake. You misconceive the content of your experience. You're not seeing the nature of it. You develop the sense of ownership and sense of self, the external self that's in charge of this whole thing. And then, despite being paired with unpleasant feelings and so on, you still can't see that you are not in control of those things. And instead of take that as a way of, 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 of liberating yourself from that gratuitous assumption of ownership, of control, you then try to like, like destroy the whole thing while actually aiming at destroying that ownership and that sense of self. But as, as I said before, as the suttas say, the upadana, the assumption of self or any other assumption, it's not the five aggregates, but it's not to be far, found apart from them. So you need to discern the nature of the five aggregates so you stop having desire and lust in regard to five aggregates. As a result of that, the sense of self that's being simultaneously generated by it ceases. But people don't know that, so then they just try to destroy the problem. Just dismiss the problem, and that's how you solve the problem. So that's why suicide is bad. Because on account of the problem, you just perpetuated the problem, but then remove the possibility of understanding the problem in any foreseeable future. So what, what about people who have understood the problem? The Arahants? Yeah. Well, their suicide, like in the suttas, when Arahants committed suicide, it's not a suicide. Because they were not aiming or trying to get rid of that sense of self. They were not, obviously not distraught or anything. They were depressed. Or... Yeah, they, they, well, they, as the Buddha would say, um, 
he wouldn't use the word death as like they kill themselves. He would say they, they would um, the ones they were sick, physically sick. The body was just in this horrible, falling apart state, dysentery and whatnot, beyond repair, beyond medicine. And they already uprooted everything in regard to that experience. So then they just um, literally sped up. Quicken the process. Quicken the, the, that which was already coming to its end. By freeing the sense of, freeing the assumption of the external world, freeing the, uh, the, removing the, the notion of appropriation, the body that has still remained for an arahant, the five aggregates, are the last. Because there is no desire and lust in regard to it, there is no reappearance of the content anymore. Once this body breaks apart, it will not carry on, basically. That's it. This is the true ending. So, for an arahant like Venerable Chana in Majjhima who was so ill and so sick in constant discomfort, he thought, well, he has no reason to wait whether this body will break apart in five years or five days, because he's done the work of uprooting everything. Nothing so, more to be done. So, sorry? There's nothing more to There's be done. There's nothing more to be done. So then, because the circumstances of that body uh, were so um, disagreeable, he had no reason to endure it. Why, why would he endure it? Nothing to prove, nothing to do anymore. So then he's just decided to, to, to kill that body. As in just to, instead of waiting for five years for it to disintegrate, he done it in five days. But that's a valid thing to do only after you become an Arahant. Otherwise, if there is still desire and lust in regard to that dead body that you are trying to kill, means you are committing a suicide. To a various degree, obviously. Depending on how much desire and lust is a motivator for that action. But for an Arahan, it can't be any. So for him, it's truly just, 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 just uh, fast, like speeding up the process of the disintegration of the five aggregates. But if there is desire and lust in regard to it, they, they are not disintegrating. Mm -hmm. Means you do remain bound with the nature of them, which means you will keep reappearing. So the, the reason why suicide is, is is very unwholesome, it's because by doing it, you you end up binding yourself most likely with even less fortunate content of your five aggregates, which will then prevent the possibility of of, of reflection necessary for uh, removing the assumption and then developing wisdom and understanding. For example, the animal realm. So, through your own ignorance, um, greed, aversion, delusion, and, uh, and assumptions of wrong assumptions in the sense of self, you committed acts then that um, removed even further the possibility for you understanding that problem in the first place. And which means then you have to re uh, keep enduring samsara much longer because of your own ignorant actions. So, that's why somebody who is not an arahant, it's actually better not to kill themselves, not to commit suicide, and endure it. Obviously, a lot of people who are not even practicing, we've got a heavy disease, painful disease, mm. some cancer of some kind, and there is no cure. Yeah. For example, they, they're in a lot of pain. Yeah. Then yeah. they choose, say, euthanasia. Sure. To kill sure. themselves. Because go to, go to Switzerland. there is no hope. <laughs> go to Switzerland. No, yeah. well, it's it's true that, that the time will come when there is no hope. But what it's not true is that that pain is the greatest pain that you can experience. Because the mind that's, that's still affected by ignorance, like the worst pain of the human realm, might not be anything in comparison to the to the pains of, 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 of lower, of being paired with lower types of content in your future reappearances. Right. So th from that point of again, any reference you can make it's based on this life, and it seems unbearable. But you have actually no idea which where you are heading. So that's why it's better to try and make absolutely most of it while you can, because you will die eventually. Try to endure pain. Try to endure it, yeah. And the developed mind can endure it. Mm. If the mind did not have or if it, has been, if it has been undermined and eroded for a longer time, so it couldn't develop to the same extent. But even then, there is a serious amount of responsibility uh, if, if a person commits suicide and they still have the wrong view. There's still a Patujana, 
they still haven't understood even what nature of Nibbana is because, because they might be um, removing that possibility of understanding it they remove it for a long long time because if they if their next next births and rebirths and reappearances whatever you want to call it are uh, lower than the human realm or even if they are higher if it's just infused with divine pleasures you won't be thinking and reflecting much so that's why you really want to make the most of this this opportunity that you have where you can reflect with that right balance which is what human realm is but if you've done that work if you fully free the whole experience of the fire there's no external assumptions no conceivings there is no suicide there is no murder there is no death but it is something that everyone should be uh, training towards because everyone is going some some way or not. yeah ultimately and that should be that's pretty much the, the soul uh, the, the aim of any being in any realm should be freeing themselves from being bound with that uh, with the content of their experience with the samsara so just in terms of yeah, enduring pain painful yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's like the beginning of restraint as well like while you're healthy you start practicing that because when the senses start falling apart, if you haven't practiced restraint uh, and, and enduring, uh, you, you won't be able to.